In this episode, we're diving into the machining side of Fusion 360, the part that turns the idea of giant-scale Grumman Goose seaplane model into an actual physical airplane. In the first video of this series, I talked about the overall concept, did some early design refinement, and mentioned that we'd be coming back into Fusion 360 to start CNC machining the model. Well, this episode is where that really begins. I've taken the original 3D model and scaled it to the size I want it to be. Now it's finally time to start carving material away. But before I do that, I want to walk through the decisions that got me here. Once the 3D model was shaped, I technically could have chosen just about any scale. But since I have access to a Cam Master Panther CNC with a 5 foot by 10 foot bed, I couldn't resist. It wasn't practical, but it was kind of impossible for me not to try and go big. So the next question was, how big is too big? And that answer came from the power system. I'm building this around E-Flight Power 60 motors, which, by the way, I already had one of. I'm so sorry, girl. We're going to have to borrow this motor for a minute. I promise to bring it back, though. So I bought a second one, and another speed controller, and another 6S 5200 milliamp hour battery along with a pile of servos for flaps, ailerons, control surfaces, and retracts. I ran the numbers, and based on what I had to work with and how this model is being built, the airframe, obviously CNC carved from XPS foam, and it'll be finished using thin habitite silk reinforced with water-based polyurethane and some fiberglass in key structural areas. That combination should keep the structure significantly lighter than more traditional builds at this size. A true quarter scale goose ended up being just beyond what this power system could comfortably support. So after balancing power, weight, and performance, I landed on a 100-inch wingspan model. With that current configuration, twin power 60s, two 6S 5200 packs, standard servos, and no main landing gear installed yet, I'm expecting the model to come in around 14 pounds ready to run. That gives me a comfortable margin while I finish dialing in the structure before adding main gear in a later episode. Before we go any further, I want to set expectations on the CNC side of this build. This is not an exhaustive CNC tutorial and I'm not presenting myself as a CNC expert, I'm a hobbyist with a big idea. I'm intentionally staying in a very narrow lane here, cutting XPS foam on a Cam Master Panther CNC using two specific Amana cutting foam bits. Every speed, feed, and strategy I'll talk about is tuned specifically to that setup and that setup alone. CNC is a massive field, and what works here may not translate to other machines, materials, or tooling. I also want to be upfront about something else. Although I didn't start from zero, I did have some basic CNC training, and I had some hands-on experience, meaning I built a few cabinets. But I don't have a seasoned CNC professional standing beside me while I dial in this foam idea. So in that gap, I've been using ChatGPT as a coach and a sounding board to sanity check my assumptions and to help fine-tune settings. Now, this is not replacing experience. Everything is validated at the machine. And I'll be honest, there have been suggestions that didn't pan out. Either Fusion rejected them in of itself, or in the end, it didn't improve real-world cut time. But what I can say for sure is this. I made far fewer mistakes than I would have on my own, and I never ruined a workpiece or broke a tool. Now for me, that alone makes ChatGPT a worthy sidekick from now on. All right, a little less talk, a little more action. Everything moving forward starts inside Fusion 360 when CNC comes later. I don't machine inside my main design file. Instead, I reference the model into a new Fusion file dedicated strictly to manufacturing. 
And from there, once in the machining tab, under setup, I can create a manufacturing model. This gives me a clean snapshot of the geometry specifically for machining. I can suppress details, simplify features, and even create a solid body that represents my raw stock and not deal with any of this in my design model. In my case, raw stock is two inch XBS foam available from Home Depot. I cut the foam to the size on the table saw that I need. And of course, as you can imagine, it cuts like butter very cleanly. I measure it and model the exact stock dimensions inside the manufacturing model. This keeps Fusion honest. Now I define the machine. Now I create a new setup. And then in that setup, I select my machine, which for me is a Cam Master Panther. Now I was going to go through a long description of how to set one of these up, and I realized I would lose half of you. But this is a very important step. Autodesk does have a library of machines that you can select from. If your machine isn't here, you will have to use a generic template and then specify exactly what the capabilities of your machine are. Very important step, but I'm going to stay in my narrow lane here on this video because I want to cut some airplane parts. Now what you see here is I'm going to define my stock and I'm going to do it from a solid body that I created earlier. This makes life easier for me. Then I'm going to define what my model is that I intend to cut. So you see me selecting that. And now I'm going to uh, create my orientation for my workpiece. And I'm going to pick the upper left corner of my box. And you see the icon move to that orientation. Now That orientation can be in any direction. But I just prefer it to be in the z-axis up. Now, earlier, you saw me rotate a piece of my manufacturing model and literally align it so that the axis would, in fact, be up. It doesn't have to be this way, but it just keeps it kind of clear in my head. You can choose to do this however you wish. Now, let's get into tools. And this is where discipline matters. Fusion's default tool library is really kind of built for metal. And obviously, that's not what we're doing. So I will create custom tools for the two Amana foam cutting bits I'm using. I defined real geometry, flute length, overall length, and shaft diameter. This is also, by the way, why I'm using two inch foam vertically. I'm limited by the bits that I own. Yes, longer foam bits exist. I just didn't expect to be machining a fuselage nearly 10 inches wide. Tool definitions do more than describe the cutter. They tell Fusion how far the tool can reach and when collisions are possible. With foam, mistakes are forgiving. With other materials, they get expensive fast. So let's talk about feeds, speeds, and chip load. This is where we define spindle speed and chip load. Manufacturers publish guidelines for specific tools and materials. Go to aggressive and you can break a tool. Go to conservative and you leave performance on the table, which actually wears tools out faster. If you're seeing dust instead of chips, you've got something wrong. Proper chip load carries heat away from the cutters, which extend tool life. Now this could be its own video, but I'll just stay in my own lane here. For this bit, cutting XPS foam, these are the values that I use. Well, let's see what ChatGPT says about it. I'm going to copy and paste dialog display of my speeds and feeds. I'm going to go into ChatGPT and simply ask it to validate what these speeds are. Now, it already has a bit of a memory in ChatGPT because I've done this several times, so it kind of knows where I'm headed here. And when it comes back, it gives me its thoughts on it. And fortunately, for the most part, since we've done this in the past, those numbers have been dialed in and I have in fact run them and they work. Uh, but it does continue to give me just a few other helpful little suggestions. You can decide to use them or not. It's entirely up to you. But it's just such a great sidekick and coach.
So I guess I need to show you exactly what it is that I'm actually going to even do. We have this setup that we created here, and then under it, I have two finishing strategies, or well, two milling strategies. I have Morph Spiral as my roughing strategy, and I have Scallop as my finishing strategy. You can get to these up here in this top section. Uh, it has a few suggested at the top, and then you can grab your pull-down menu and select from all of these. Now, many of you out there, if you know much about this, you're going to say, well, wait, Morph Spiral is a finishing strategy. Yeah, it is. Uh, but I'm using it quite successfully as a roughing strategy because I'm using, one, a flat-end mill on it, and two, I'm using a pretty heavy load on this bit. And then when I go over to my Passes tab, probably most critically, is I have this checkbox checked, Stock to Leave, 0.125 inches. And so that leaves material on the stock, shy of the finished surface, so that when you come back with your finished strategy, it has some material to clean up. And in fact, you'll be able to see this right here as the finishing strategy starts and you can see it cutting just a little bit deeper and a little more cleanly into the final bit of material. Before anything goes into the machine, I run a full simulation. The simulation isn't a checkbox, it's a design tool. If something looks wrong here, I fix it before the cutter ever touches the material. All right, at this point, the toolpaths are defined the stock is set, and everything looks clean. At least, that's what Fusion tells me. So, the last step inside Fusion is to post-process the code. This is where Fusion takes everything we just planned and turns it into something the machine can actually understand and run. I'll be posting this using a WinCNC compatible post-processor and save the G-code out to a file. And that's where Fusion's job and this segment ends for now, but only for a while. In the next episode, we'll step into WinCNC and set up everything at the machine. And that includes setting up the job on the CNC, loading the G-code, defining the stock actual real-world location. Remember that point we selected on our stock? That will then make sense. And we'll find and set zero as accurately as possible in the real world. And then finally, hit that go button and watch the magic happen. All the while making the workshop look like a surfboard shaper lives there. Foam shavings get staticky, by the way, who knew? And once the carving starts, this project moves fast. Coming up after that, I will be tackling my first ever two-sided CNC milling job to carve the wings, which comes with its own unique challenges. Before I can close the fuselage, I need to finish the tail wheel design in Fusion and manufacture it, and install pushrod cables for the rudder and elevator. Inside the fuselage, I will be designing, laser cutting, and installing the wing attached structures, servo trays, ESC mounts, battery mounts, and even a dedicated ESC cooling fan. I'll be designing the engine nacelles, motor mounts strong enough for these big motors, and dummy radial engines that we will 3D print. We'll get into wing spars, how they're built, how they're reinforced into foam, and how everything stays detachable. I don't have space for a 100 inch wingspan model. Then there's the control system, split flaps like the real goose, ailerons, servos, and linkages. And also, I'll show how I'm lightweight 3D printing the engine cowlings, reinforcing them with ultralight fiberglass and finishing them cleanly. I'll walk through how I used Fusion 360 to calculate center of gravity, or as Fusion would call it, center of mass, before anything was created in the real world. We'll cover assembly techniques, the specific glues I'm using and why, and finally, I'll go deep into finishing with lightweight fiberglass, habitized silk, and how to get a strong, clean surface without adding unnecessary weight to this model. And I'll be using water-based finishing system on this because of the foam. 
I paint cars. Water-based finishes feel completely foreign to me unless I'm painting a wall in my house. I have no idea how that part will go. So I'll show my failures and successes and my thoughts on this type of a system. If any of that sounds interesting, you'll want to stick around because in the next video, this stops being a digital project and becomes a real model. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next at the machine.